Not in it to win it. When I was 17 years old, my parents decided to uproot our whole family and migrated to Perth, Western Australia. And I hated it. I hated every minute of it. Don't get me wrong, I love living in Perth now. All right, I've lived in so many different cities in my life. This is the city I want to die in. Unless God moved me somewhere else, this is by far the best city in the whole wide world. West Coast, best coast. Amen? Let's go. But at that time, I hated it. I came into a new country, an unfamiliar territory, out of my own will. Not because I wanted to, but because my parents decided to, against my will. I left behind some good friends. I left behind good food, I thought. I left behind a lot of things that I was familiar with, and I hated every minute of me being in a situation that I don't want to be in. I want to ask you this morning, have you ever been in a situation that you don't want to be in? You live in Perth, but you wish you were in Melbourne or Sydney or Singapore, or maybe for you it's not a physical place. Maybe you're in a marriage that you don't want to be in. Maybe you're in a job that you don't want to be in. You're in a church that you don't want to be in, right? And for that matter, as a Christian, right, as followers of Jesus, as the church, I'm talking about the big C church, many of you find yourself living more and more in a world that you really don't want to be in because you are watching Christians slowly losing its influence in this world. And this is proven. This is not just your feelings. This is proven by statistics. Last year, according to the census, for the first time in our country's history, all right, this is from the Sydney Morning Herald, the number of people associating themselves with Christianity. Look at that thing in the, in the red box. Uh, the Australian Bureau of Statistics last year shows that just 44% of Australians now identify as Christian, down from 52% five years earlier and 61% in 2011. So, at this rate, there will no longer be Christians in a matter of a few years in Australia, right? And this makes you feel very, very uncomfortable. Being a Christian in your own country, you feel like you're being oppressed, you feel like you're being persecuted. The question that I want to ask you is, what do you do when the situation that you're in is different from your expectation? What do you do? Right? You can do what I did, which is complaining and moaning and, and pointing fingers and, and doing all that. Or, this is what a lot of people do as well, they put their life on hold. If I get a better job, then I'll work really, really hard. If I get out of this situation, then I will show a good attitude. If I get to another church that is better than my church right now, then I'll start serving. Then I'll start giving. But until then, I'm just going to put my life on hold. What do you do when the situation that you're in is different from your expectation? There's a verse in the Bible that is a source of comfort whenever we are in this situation, right? When the life that you live is less than ideal, maybe you're in a situation that is less than ideal, maybe your physical health is failing away and you don't like the fact that you are sick all the time and you're waiting for that healing that never happened. So what do you do in that situation? 
there's this one verse that has become a life verse for a lot of people. It has become a memory verse for a lot of people. It gives us a lot of comfort. But let me tell you, this is one of those verses that is most misinterpreted, most misunderstood, misapplied in the lives of Christians. I'm talking about Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Many of you memorize this. Many, many of you wrote this as a, as a text that you give to your friend whenever they're suffering, right? And this is what Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And rightly so, this verse gives us a lot of comfort. So you say to yourself, for example, I can stay where I am right now because I know God has better plans for me, right? I can stand this job that I'm in right now. I'm not very happy, but not to worry. That's okay because God has a better job waiting for me. And until then, I'm just going to stay put where I am. This is how we apply this verse, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just bear this marriage for a little bit because I know God has prepared something better for me in the future. Maybe a better husband, maybe a better wife. So this is how we misapply this verse a lot of times in our life, okay? Now, I'm going to tell you this morning that this verse is so much more than that, okay? In fact, that is actually a misapplication of this verse. And I want to tell you right now, before you start dozing off, for those of you watching online, before you go to the toilet, this is what I believe this verse means, right? It means so much more than what a lot of people understand it to be. This verse means this, that God's best plans are often found in life's worst events, all right? That's exactly what Jeremiah 29, 11 means. So what God is saying is this, where you are right now, you can be blessed. Where you are right now, you can thrive. I don't want you to put your life on hold, right? Don't say, if I get a better job, then I go above and beyond. Don't say that. Don't say, if I move to another church, then I'll get my passion back. Don't say that, right? Don't wait until things turn around before you give your best. Right where you are, God says, you can thrive. That means you need to show good attitude right now where you are. You need to go above and beyond in your current job that you really, really hate right now, all right? You got to give your very best because His plans can happen even in the worst of life's situation, all right? Let me prove it to you that this is actually the actual meaning of Jeremiah 29 verse 11. One of the things you got to do when you do Bible studies, you got to read the verse in its context, right? That's the most important rule in Bible interpretation. You cannot take verses out of context. As much as I value memory verse and all that, you don't take a verse to be a memory verse until you understand the context first. So this morning, we're going to look at the context of Jeremiah 29 11 and find out what it actually means for us today, all right? Jeremiah 29, 11 is written during the time of what is known as the divided kingdoms. I don't know if you know, but after the reign of King Solomon, Israel is divided into two different kingdoms, two different nations. You have Israel up in the north, and then you have Judah down in the south, all right? There are 10 tribes that follow Israel up north, and there are only two tribes in Judah, which is Judah and Benjamin. And the capital city of Israel is Samaria, and the capital city of Judah is Jerusalem. You can see that in the border of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. All right, so no more United Kingdom, no more UK after the time of King Solomon. And then what happens next uh, is this. The Assyrian came and attacked Israel in the north in 721 BC. That's what happened. They came and they conquered Israel, and they tried to conquer Judah as well, actually, but they failed. So they fled all the way back to Nineveh, to their hometown, and because they failed in their quest to destroy and conquer Judah. But not for long, because about 120-something years later, a new superpower, the Babylonians, came and this time successfully attacked and destroyed Judah. All right? And what happened was they actually demolished everything. They destroyed the temple. They killed the people. It was horrible. All right? And they took some of the best people from Judah and brought them back to Babylon, including Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So if you know, want to know the context of the story of Daniel, 
This is the context of the story of Daniel. Daniel and his three friends, among all the other top people of Judah, were taken as captives back to Babylon. And they left the farmers, the uneducated, the ordinary people to stay in Judah to continue farming so that they continue to produce things for them to uh, enjoy back in Babylon. And what is interesting is Jeremiah, that wrote Jeremiah 29, 11, he was left behind in Judah. He was not one of those taken into captivity in Babylon. And, and, and Jeremiah saw firsthand the killing, right? The massacre. He saw firsthand the crying babies and the crying widows and orphans, the destruction of Jerusalem that was like really, really terrible. He saw it firsthand. He experienced it firsthand like many other people did at the time. And that's why Jeremiah wrote a book called Lamentations. L to lament means to be in deep sorrow. So he wrote this book called Lamentations. From time to time, if you have time, read it. It's a wonderful book, all right? If, especially if you're going through suffering. Now, uh, but the people who were taken into captives, they were not any better. You know, to be in exile, to be in a captivity can be profoundly distressing. I experienced it firsthand when I moved to Perth as a 17-year-old kid, not knowing the language, not knowing the people, not knowing the culture. And that's exactly what happened to the people of Judah who were brought to Babylon. Now, this morning, I want you to imagine with me, okay? Imagine we are all the people of Judah who are taken as captives to Babylon. Imagine that. Imagine all of a sudden, you had to live in a new country, with the, a new culture that you're not familiar with, new language that you don't know, new customs, right? New food that you're not familiar with. You don't even like the food probably because they're not familiar to you. Everything is new. Everything that is familiar, you had to leave behind. No more temple to worship God in. No more songs that you normally sing to each other. No more familiar food that you have, this and that, that you are so familiar and take comfort in. They're all gone. All of a sudden... You had to live in a new place out of your own will, a place that you don't like, a place that you don't want to be at. You know how distressing that can be, all right? But there were false prophets who tried to comfort the people of Judah who were taken as captives in Babylon. And these false prophets said, not to worry, man. In two years, God is going to take you back to Jerusalem. So you just have to stay put for the next two years. And the people were like, two years? That's a long time. But, you know, they thought about it. Maybe two years, not so bad. I mean, we can stay here for but two years, explore the place a little bit maybe. But, you know, uh, they were like not happy that they were going to be there for two years. But, okay, because we know God has plans for us, for a better future. All right, we're just going to stay put here for two years. And then they hear that Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, who was left behind in Judah, they wrote that he wrote a letter to them. And they got excited. Maybe God is going to shorten this time. Maybe it's not two years anymore. Maybe this is going to be six months only. Wow, they're all so excited. So after they finish work, they gather in a room like this. I'm just using my imagination. And because they're about to hear from God through the prophet Jeremiah how God is going to have a wonderful plan and shorten the time of their captivity in Babylon. Right? So this is what God says through Jeremiah. Jeremiah 29 verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Notice right from the get-go, God established His sovereignty. God is saying to the people of Israel, you think King Nebuchadnezzar was the one who brought you to Babylon. No, 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 no. I brought you here. I carried you into this captivity. Are you sure, God? I thought you are for us. How come you carried us into this, in, into this captivity? You see, the people of Judah at the time, they were rebelling against God. They were, and they were worshiping idol, right? <laughs> they were doing everything. They were being disobedient to God. And God, because God loved them, just like any parent who loved their children would discipline their children, correct? How many of you are parents and you discipline your children for their own good? This is exactly what God did. And God said, you think the king, Nebuchadnezzar, was the one who brought you here? No, I allowed him to bring you here to discipline you. Sometimes God can 
allow the enemies, your enemies, to triumph over you, uh, to discipline you, to restore you back to a good place with him. So that's exactly what God did. God said, I am still in control. That's exactly what God is saying. I'm still in control here. I allowed him to do this to you. And then God continues in verse 5. Build houses, settle down, plant gardens, and eat what they produce. Build houses, that's going to take a long time, right? I mean, if you know that building house take, takes a long time, even here in Perth, building house takes a long time right now. And I'm, as I'm imagining back then, it also takes a long time. Build houses. We don't want to build houses here. Build houses and settle down. Settle down. I thought we are going to be here for only two years. And as they're thinking about this, they look at the false prophet standing on the, on the side, just looking down, you know. <laughs> That's what happened. We don't want to settle down. We don't want to build houses. What God is saying is, you're going to be here a while. How well? Well, let me tell you how well. God continued in verse 6. Marry and have sons and daughters. Those of you who are singles, get married. Have sons and daughters. Not only that, when your sons and daughters grow older, find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage. We're talking about the second generation now. And then, not just that, so that they too may have their own sons and daughters increase in number there and do not decrease. They're going to be there a while. Three generations are going to stay in Babylon. Not two years, more like maybe 20 years, maybe more. We're talking about three generations here, right? And if that's not bad enough, okay, this is what God says. God continues. Jeremiah 29 verse 7. And also, while you're there, Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Another reminder, I carried you into exile. So I want you to seek peace and prosperity for the city that you live in. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. You know, the word for peace in the Hebrew language is shalom. The word shalom means God's loving kindness, His chesed, His loving kindness that produces peace, that passes all understanding. We're talking about, you know, this idea of peace that is exclusively from God for the people of Israel, exclusively for Jerusalem, right? By the way, Jerusalem is Jerusalem, shalom. It means the same thing, city of peace. The people of Israel thought God's shalom is only for Israel, is only for His people, what do you mean seek shalom for Babylon? These are our captors. These are our enemies. You want us to pray for peace for them. Are you kidding me, God? That's exactly what God says. God says, you're going to be here a while, all right? I want you to get married. Have your children to get married. Have their children to get married because I want you to get into this season. I want you to get into the rhythm of living in Babylon. Stay where you are. Seek the peace and prosperity of the place that you live in. That means if you live in Singapore and you don't want to be in Singapore, get comfortable living there. Learn how to cook chicken rice, right? Learn how to do math really, really well. That's what you got to do. If you're in Australia and you don't want to be here, man, enjoy meat pies, right? Cross the Nullarbor, you know, do whatever Aussies do. I crossed the Nullarbor twice uh, in my life. I'm more Aussie than some of you, all right? So that's exactly what God is saying. you got to be comfortable where you are because you're going to be here for some time. you got to be part of that community. You're going to be part of that city. you got to not separate yourself. You don't, I'm not gonna, I don't want you to isolate yourself. I want you to integrate with the people there. I want you to get married. I need to work with them, send your kids to school, you know, do whatever is necessary because you're not in it to win it. You're in it to bless it, right? This, you're not here to win anything, God says. You're not in it to win it. You're in it to bless it. How many of us as Christians, we think we are here to win the cultural war? We're here to win the ethical moral war. We're here to win, you know, the, 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 the sex war, right? We don't like it when, when the community from the LGBTQIA++ come to us with their agenda. We don't like it when the woke people got to us with their agenda. We're going to fight it, all right? If you're American, we're going to put the Ten Commandments back in school. You know, we're going to fight everything with all we got because this is not right. What we see is not right. It's not the will of God. We're going to win this war. If you read Jeremiah 29 carefully, God says, uh-uh, you're not in it to win it. 
You're in it to bless it. You want to change the city? Love it. You want to change your government? Pray for your government. Pray for shalom for your government. Those of you who are complaining about the Australian government, how many times you pray for them? How many times you ask for shalom, for peace for this country, for this city? Instead of complaining all the time, God says, no, seek for its peace, seek for its prosperity, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Here's a different way to put it. The church will look more like Christ when we are giving away rather than demanding our way. Okay? The church will look more like Christ. We have it in the text. This is what we're supposed to do. Stop demanding our way all the time, thinking like, oh, this, this is not acceptable. Australia is a pagan non- nation now. This is not acceptable. Well, how do you like it when people of different faith force their faith on you? Would you like it? Would you behave? Would you have social ethics according to other people's faith? Would you? Uh, you know, if, for example, if a, if a Muslim man comes to you or a Buddhist person comes to you or a Hindu person comes to you and say, hey, you've got to follow what our holy book says. Are you going to follow? Just because the holy book says so? You won't, right? You can't demand your way. You can't force your way. You can't force people into believing what you're believing, all right? The church will look more like Jesus Christ when we are giving away. Give away peace. Give away love. Give away acceptance, forgiveness, right? Rather than demanding our way all the time. Jeremiah continues in verse uh, 10, right? This is verse 8. In verse 10, this is what the Lord says when 70 years are completed for Babylon. 70 years? At this point, I, I can imagine people are kicking tables, you know, throwing chairs, and start complaining and crying and arguing like, 70 years? How old are you, honey? You're 50. We're not going to see Jerusalem ever. It's not going to happen for sure, guaranteed. We're going to die here. 70 years. But God says when 70 years are completed for Babylon, far cry from two years that the false prophet says, yeah? I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. And then, this is verse 10. Here comes verse 11 that we all love so much. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Notice, plans is in plural. you got to notice these things, right? Plans, not just a plan. God has many plans for us. Even the situation that you're in right now, which may be less than ideal, right? Your marriage may be less than ideal. Your your workplace may be less than ideal. You know, your country that you live in, your, your, your physical health may be less than ideal. But even in a situation that is less than ideal, it is very possible that that's God's plan for your life right now, at least for this season that you're in, you know? Don't wait for the better tomorrow, before you start believing in God, before you start acting uh, right, before you start having good attitude. No, right where you are, God wants you to prosper. Right where you are, God wants you to flourish. Right where you are, God's plan can still happen in your life, for your life, right? Because God has wonderful plans for you. Not tomorrow, not next year, not when, when things get better, not when things turn around. That's when you experience God's plans for your life. No, right where you are right now. God says, build houses, plant, reap, get married, get your children to be married. Do all the things that normal people do, okay? And be a blessing where you are. Be a blessing where you are. That's what it means to be like Jesus. That's what it means to be the church. Have you seen Jesus in the New Testament demanding His way? Have you ever heard Jesus teaching you to disobey your government, to fight your government? Even during the time of the Roman Empire, the Apostle Paul, even during the time of Nero, gave us the commandment, submit to the government because God The sovereign God who is still in control of this world is the one who places authority over us. So submitting to government is like submitting to God. That's what Paul teaches us. Jesus never went 
against Rome, even when people try to trick him. Do we have to pay taxes, Jesus? And Jesus said, whose face is it on the coin? Caesar's. Then give to Caesar. What is Caesar? But Jesus, he's overtaxing us. It's heavy. Jesus didn't say, oh, in that case, yeah, you're right. You don't need to pay your taxes. No. We can't demand our way and expect people to be one to Jesus Christ. You can't expect to get your way and win your husband back and win your wife back. You can't expect to get your way and hoping your boss would turn around right where you are. Pray for shalom for your boss that you don't like. Pray for your pastor that you criticize all the time so that God will give him shalom, <laughs> will give him peace. Right? Pray for your spouse, especially if you're fighting all the time in your marriage. Pray for your spouse. Right? Don't wait for uh, the next marriage or the better marriage. Right where you are, you can prosper. You can experience the will of God in your life. That's how you interpret Jeremiah 29, 11. You don't wait until things get better, but right where you are, God is still in control. His plan is not to harm you, but to give you hope where you are and a future where you are. And when you do this, when you do this, I guarantee you, you, the people around you, will experience Jesus through your life. And, and, you may just win your community for Jesus Christ. You may just win your city for Jesus Christ. We may just win this war that we so desperately want to win, right? Because we will win them with kindness. We will win them with love. We will win them with forgiveness. We will win them with understanding. We will seek blessing, prosperity, and peace for them. And what Jesus doing only what He can do. Amen? Amen. Why don't we stand on our feet right now as we close this time together. It is a custom in our church to be dismissed by receiving a prayer of blessing. And after the prayer of blessing, our prayer leaders will be standing here. They love to pray for you and with you. If you're struggling, you're in pain, you're going through hardship, please share it with us. We want to pray for you. We are your family. Okay? Right now, if you're comfortable, you have the faith to receive it, why don't you open your hands as a sign of our dependence on God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we heard today. God, thank you for reminding us that we're not in it to win it. But God, we're in it to bless it. Thank you, Lord. I pray that you bless people's marriages right now. Bless people's jobs and situation that they're in right now. Bless their health right now, where they are. I ask God that you remind them that right where we are, we can experience your goodness. Right where we are, you can, we can experience your kindness. We can experience your plan, your wonderful plan for our lives. We thank you, Lord. Dismiss us with your blessings, we pray. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship, the power, the anointing of the Holy Spirit be with you wherever you go. May God bless you. May God bless your family. May God bless your work, your business, your relationship, your finance, your health. May God bless everything about, there's to bless about you so that people around you will be blessed and God's name will be glorified now and forevermore. Everyone who's blessed, sit together with me. Amen. Amen. God bless you, everybody. Have a wonderful Sunday. I'll see you next Sunday. God bless you.